Back to My Garden, Episode 49. Welcome to Back to My Garden. Discover your passion for gardening. Here's Dave Ledoux. Are you concerned about toxic chemicals, GMOs, and frankenfood? Me too. Don't panic. Grow organic. Discover my new resource for organic gardening. Go to www.backtomygarden.com front slash myorganic. Attention garden lovers! Do you want to save time, save money, and have your most incredible garden ever? Receive free tips, strategies, and gardening techniques from expert gardeners around the world. Join the VIP club for free today at www.backtomygarden.com front slash VIP. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world when you listen to this. I'm Dave Ledoux, and welcome to another edition of Back to My Garden. Exciting episode today. Our guest, Paul, builds gardens. Brilliant, beautiful, inspiring gardens. He lectures on plants, design, and plant history. He is the proud winner of nine RHS medals. He is plant obsessive and a self-proclaimed design geek. I want to welcome to the show from Cotswold, England, Paul Harvey Brooks. Welcome to the show, Paul. Hello. Thank you for having me. Very excited to hear your stories, and I know our guests want to get to know you a little bit as well, Paul, so I gave you a brief introduction. Take a minute or two, and just share with our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got into gardening. Okay, I think it's quite difficult sometimes to um, talk about oneself, particularly um, your career, but the good thing about gardens and horticulture is often um, you start from a, a point of being passionately interested in something and then you find that you don't really want to do anything else so it becomes your day job as well which is a luxury. Um, I guess now I spend a lot of my time designing gardens for private clients and I do that um, all across the world not just in England so I'm quite lucky Um, but I didn't always do that. I've had quite a checkered past and I've spent time working in nurseries before I became a landscape architect And before that, I originally studied in Edinburgh um, classification, how plants are named. And it's been quite a long dog-leg journey. But originally, um, as a child, I was just very interested because I was lucky to live next door to an elderly couple in Oxford. And um, they grew everything uh, in their garden in a very traditional way. And they had lots of vegetables and cut flowers. And as gardeners do, they shared cuttings and bulbs and all sorts of things with me and I guess it's just that magic of creating something uh, and being totally at leisure to make it how you want it to be which first made me very interested. Fantastic. You used excellent words like magic and creating. You've already captured our listeners imaginations. Now, Paul and I are going to sit back and talk about gardening. For those of you listening in rush hour traffic or running with your iPods, We're going to put all of the links that he shares, and I have a feeling there may even be some Latin in the show today, so don't try to take notes with your thumbs. We'll put it up on the blog at Back to My Garden. Make sure you follow Paul on Twitter. He's got a brilliant social media presence. It's at Harvey Brooks. Now, let me spell it for you. It's H-E-R-V-E-Y-B-R-O-O-K-E-S. I got that right, right, Paul? Yes, you did. Thank you. And your blog is amazing. It's www.paulharveybrooks.com. You share visuals, you share theory, you share experiences. And I can't think that anyone listening who gets to know you doesn't think of you as an expert. But I want to take you back to the days before you weren't an expert, you were a novice. Can you remember what your first garden as an adult was like? Um, yes, it was very small. Uh, uh, the, the first, I think um, you have your childhood garden, and I was quite lucky that I was able to garden in my parents' garden at free will, but it was never mine, so it was, it was limitation. But the first garden I had, I had a little flat, which was the first property I bought, and it had a tiny garden. Uh, and a flight of stairs that went out of it to connect to a kind of raised level. And everything was grown in pots because the soil was so bad. Um, and I even made little uh, retaining ledges for the steps to put grass down. It was the only place you could have any grass. 
And I would look back at it fondly because it had a collection of all the things I liked, but I hadn't really developed any sense of style. So it was very eclectic and it was just bits and bobs that gave me joy to look at. And as a novice, did everything you touch grow or were there anything, uh, any mishaps in the garden in the early days? Um, I think there's a lot of mishaps. Uh, the person that gardens without them isn't really gardening. And it's, it's only through that that you, um, you really develop the things you like. And I often say, particularly of English gardeners, if they garden on heavy clay, then they'll want to grow things that require full sun and poor soil. And if they're gardening on poor soil around Sussex, they'll be wanting everything that needs heavy clay because uh, we naturally want to grow what's very difficult. And so I paid no attention to the climate and wanted to grow lots of lovely exotic plants and tetrapanax and all sorts of things that really didn't want to be in a shady garden. And uh, it was littered with disaster, but there was always something that grew really well and surprised me. So that was good. I would imagine in your career you end up cleaning up other people's messes or inheriting messes before you get to work your magic. Uh, do you find people try to use their ego to grow things that just don't belong? Um, I, I'm not sure if it's ego. I mean, it's, it's interesting. When you um, are presented with a client's garden, there will always be plants which are in the wrong place. Now, it's in the wrong place for two reasons. One, uh, and the most often is because it was planted 30 years ago and nobody really knew it would turn into a 150-foot tree by the front door. Um, <laughs> That happens a lot. It doesn't just happen to me. Uh, the other is that people um, have these these strange obsessions. So you'll get, well, my great aunt Mavis, she really loved hydrangeas. And so I grow the hydrangea, even though it won't particularly enjoy the situation it's in, or it enjoys it so much that it's now turned into a huge bush that you can't walk past. Um, rarely, it does happen, rarely do you end up taking on a garden that's been designed before and designed not very well. Um, but, of course, not very well is also then dependent on who did you design it for. And often if you've been brought in you know, 10, 20 years later, it's because it's a different person and they want something different out of that space. So um, there are lots of things that you look to change. And often I hope that there are one or two things that will be there when I'm not around because that's always nice. Oh, brilliant. The, the enduring nature of gardens. Uh, I bet you you have a lot of plants with stories of the people that gave you that plant. Yes, I think we all, we all have that. I mean, there's a, there's a great story that I know um, from when I was in my teenage years. I was lucky enough to go and visit the two ladies who had gardened with me to Circle West at Sissinghurst. And they said um, whenever they were invited to dinner, people used to give them uh, plants, uh, gardening friends will give them plants and actually it's now a standing joke that whenever you go somewhere you take a plant with you that somebody else gave you or a bit of it and you've propagated it and, and people stop looking at borders and the beautiful garden and just want to get around to the greenhouse to see what's being propagated. Oh, what a great idea because you can never go visiting empty-handed. No, and no, that's true. <laughs> rather than cookies or a bottle of wine, give them something they'll have for years and years. Exactly. I love that. So I've got things like Viola Labradorica, which have now lovingly seeded their way through paths and all sorts. And I know who gave me that original plant, and Meliampus major. I know who gave me that plant originally, and now I have quite a nice one. So it's good. It gives you lots of um, good memories. Speaking of memories, I know you're well-traveled, plus you have exciting trips coming up. Can you talk to us a little bit about... You're playing a game at the highest level... Uh, can you just tickle the imaginations of the listeners where you've been and where you're going to just create beautiful things? Um, well, I've, I've been very lucky to um, do Chelsea Flower Show for, for four years. Um, for me, that's, that's it's a huge honor, but it's at home. So it um, doesn't have the same mystique, I guess, as if you travel to other countries. You always find that really exciting. And um, I've worked in the Middle East and worked uh, in Europe, in Central Europe, and I have um, been to Japan and New Zealand, and I shall be going back to Japan, and I shall also be going to America next year. And for me, that's hugely exciting, because, uh, you know, tell a 14-year-old child that if they 
um, studying going to horticulture, it doesn't mean they'll be for endlessly cleaning roundabouts and cutting grass. It means they can travel the world. They wouldn't believe you, but that's exactly what it can do. And I just think that's hugely exciting. I know you've been to Japan before. Can you comment on a little bit? They have a unique culture and a unique uh, attitude towards gardening, don't they? They do. Uh, they have a really interesting um, structure in their society. And everybody's very polite and very respectful. Um, and it's really nice. They're very gentle people. Uh, and there's so many symbolic meanings in their gardens and where they place particular stones or trees and the shape they'll cut the trees into is interpreted as something. Uh, and it was just amazing to spend a very brief amount of time beginning to scratch the surface of all of that identity, very different way of gardening. Um, and the really unique thing about what I'm invited to do in Japan, it's the Gardening World Cup, is that they have in designers from all around the world and we all, um, it's a bit of a busman's holiday, we all spend four weeks creating our own gardens next door to each other, uh, learning a lot from each other and then the public can come and look at them. But the overriding thing for me, not just uh, with the Japanese culture, is how we all have um, an inherent sense of identity that we may not even realize is there, but when we start designing and making spaces, you can see that kind of national identity being played out in the use of materials or the way the space is laid out. And, you know, as a designer, let alone how people use plants, I just find it fascinating how people put things together differently. Classic painters had influences, musicians have influences. I guess it's not a far stretch to think that flower arrangers and designers and people that use living organisms for art would have influences. Uh, yeah, exactly. The, the, I think the influences can be extremely varied. You could be um, directly influenced by gardens that you may have seen. And more often, I think it is art, architecture, music. Uh, it can even be literature sometimes, or just the person who's asked you to create a garden has such a strong identity that you can take inspiration from them. So it comes from everywhere. I was explaining to a friend of mine who gardens down in the southern climate in Florida that the English have done centuries of development on their gardens, whereas in North America it's so young and naive and new. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the gardens that you've visited that you've drawn inspiration from? Uh, yes. I mean, I think there's the classic gardens that all designers visit here, Sissinghurst and Hidcote, there's two kind of great gardens of the 20th century, uh, which have been a basis for the English style, if you like. And there are other gardens like Newby Hall, which has um, a pair of amazing herbaceous borders, which is very interesting and architecturally interesting. Lots of people will know Great Dixter, which is a fascinating marriage of a Lutchin's space laid out um, in his style, and then of course Christopher Lloyd's very eclectic planting and, and how those two sometimes sit very comfortably and sometimes have a bit of a battle. I mean we're very lucky we have um, a huge variety of gardens as the Beth Chateau Gardens which again naturalistic very different and hugely inspiring in kind of creating landscape instead of just gardens. Um, but Recently, um, quite strangely, I was in America and I went to a garden called Chanticleer, which um, was created in the 1920s. And I found that hugely inspiring because you could see um, the kind of shadows of the European and English style, but then you could see a kind of American style developing over it. And I found that really exciting because you could see the naivety that you're talking about, but at its first stages. Um, we don't get that so much because often the people that made the English gardens are, are no longer with us, so we can't directly um, talk to them about what inspired them. Mm. And you draw on all this experience and all this uh, inspiration and you go over to the World Cup in Japan. Is it, is it a rivalry? Is it... A, is it uh, supportive of each other? I mean, I, I come from an athletic background in martial arts, but I'm trying to get a feel for what it's like when you go out there at the highest level. Is there pressure? Uh, what's, your, what's your energy like? What's your thinking like? 
I, um, you're on a rush, definitely, and you work off of adrenaline. Um, I think all designers who do these things would say the competition is not with somebody else, it's with yourself. Because if you truly want to judge something, you're judging against how good what you're creating is against what was in your head. Nobody else will have the same idea. And you want the person next to you to do the best they can for themselves. And I think you'd be a pretty mean sportsman who would say, well, I hope they suffer a broken leg so I do better. That's no measure of how good you are. It's just a measure of that they broke their legs. So there's an air of competitiveness, but it's comp competing with yourself to do the best you can. And you kind of want everyone else to do really well. So if you see, you know, they've run out of plants or... Um, they need a hand with something, and you've got time. You generally give that time because uh, we're all, you know, horticulture is a nice industry. And at the end of the day, we just want everyone to do what they want to do and feel satisfied by what they're doing. Fabulous! I love that. It's an individual endeavor. Do you do you walk in the door with a clean slate, like a blank mind, and you're courting the muse, or do you go in prepared somehow? Um, I think you go prepared. You, you kind of have a set of things that you know you've got to do, um, and there's always the kind of looming time factor that set things have to be done by each day. And if it doesn't happen to that plan, then you you kind of you have a little bit of wiggle room. But if it's really running behind schedule, then you have a huge sense of pressure. So um, you kind of want to feel carefree because it's creative, and you have to feel that creative vibe but you also know it's kind of creative within very strict confines of what can be achieved brilliant i'm sure the listeners are thinking well all that's fine and dandy but what about me with my little garden of three pots and containers on my balcony can you give some advice to somebody who's just getting started small space it's daunting where's a good place for a brand new gardener to start if they want to make a beautiful space um, well, I would say that the, the one thing I look back on, I think if someone had told me that it would have made a huge difference, is to invest well. If you've got a small space, um, um, one really beautiful pot that has seasonally changing plants is much more attractive than three or four that were all kind of slightly cheaper and all get jammed together and looks a mess. So we're fine. Take things out. Often, design is about what you didn't put in, as opposed to everything that was thrown into it. So you want that space, if it's small particularly, to be elegant and beautiful. So it just requires one or two really nice things. And then when you come to think about plants, often in a small space, they have to work really, really hard. So in making choices, think to yourself, does that shrub have nice foliage? Does it flower? And in the winter, when there are no flowers and no foliage, has it got an interesting structure or is the bark exciting to look at? And that way you're making really good value and the things are always quite interesting. Sensational. <laughs> you're busy creating art for other people. You're doing a lot of uh, design work for other people. You're lecturing, you're traveling. Do you get time to garden on your personal garden? And if so, what was it like this year? Um, I do. I have um, I used to have a much bigger garden than I do now, um, and it ended up looking a dreadful mess. I used to console myself because um, in the UK we have a phrase, never employ a plumber who's got good plumbing, because they've always got too much time spent at home. Uh, so I used to say, well, it's a mess because I'm busy, uh, but it got to a point where it looked more like a jungle. So now I have quite a small garden, and um, I spend quite a bit of time in it when I can, and it's very informal, very naturalistic. There's lots of um, loose plantings of kind of shrubs and herbaceous perennials and some things that run through gravel. So it always has a slightly cottagey air. And this year it's looked at its best because I've had this particular garden for three years. So the things are just beginning to make their own character and you're beginning to see how shapes are emerging. And I quite enjoy it, particularly in the evening. I can go out with a cup of tea and do a little bit of weeding or often just a little bit of gazing and thinking it's looking good and feeling quite pleased excellent so in the in, in your garden what is bringing you joy and is there anything frustrating you um 
this year I've made um, inroads into a collection of agapanthus. So um, I have quite a few different ones. I've got uh, beautiful, very somber, dark blue, and I have things like Buckingham Palace and Windsor Grey, which is very, very attractive. There was a new um, agapanthus around this year, which is called uh, Blue Daydream, which was absolutely stunning, and I had very little plant of that. So they brought me huge joy because essentially I had agapanthus in flower from early July all the way through until September. So that was quite good. I've just finished the last ones. And I think the thing which is not bringing me joy, and I'm feeling quite frustrated with at the moment, is I had a number of Stepatonocystema planted through sage and rosemary and the pink cow parsley and different things. And for some reason, they all have kind of parted in the middle. And gardeners will know this. They look beautiful when they're kind of frothy and upright, and then something horrible happens, and they all start to collapse. So now they look a mess, and uh, that's irritating because I quite like them to stay upright all through right until the end of the season. And it does happen sometimes, but it hasn't happened this time. Now, for those who are listening... Uh, who are very visual, make sure you connect with Paul because he does share on Twitter. It's at Harvey Brooks, but Paul's blog is spectacular. So head over to www.paulharveybrooks.com. I'll have the link in the show notes so you can go and check out his uh, his gardens. Because sometimes words just can't. It's like Blue Daydream. It sounds so dreamy, and but you got to see it. Definitely. You know, our half hour is flying by, Paul. And we have a spot in the show where we play a game called Five Quick Questions. Okay. This is a chance for you to share your wisdom and experience with novice gardeners. Are you ready to play? Okay, yep. Question number one is, in your opinion, Paul, what do you think stops or scares away brand new people from even trying gardening? I would say, um, and I'm a big fan of it, but I would say people get very daunted by Latin names and when they look at a plant label, it tells them they need pH this, that and the other, they need this condition, they need that soil. And people think, oh, I don't know, I don't know any of this and I'm not going to bother because it's all going to die. Oh. Have you ever had clients come to you uh, at the end of their rope, like ready to quit? Um, often they kind of feel paralyzed by the fact that they've got a big garden and it's all running away from them and it, they don't really know how to get it in control and they don't know, you know, the right plants for the right place. But um, at the end of the day, for them and for somebody who's just started, the same thing applies. Have a go. What's the worst that can happen? It might die. It might also live and bring you years of joy. Now, I would myself hedge my bets and hope that it lives. If it doesn't live, well, I'll get something else. It must be extremely satisfying to turn despair into beauty. Um, I hope so. I mean, I often think to myself, my work as a designer is done if I create a garden that somebody owns and then not only owns and just lives with, but really takes on, uh, makes changes if they want to, brings in new plants. I'm not precious about that. I want them to have a space that makes them happy. So if that happens, and I think that's brilliant because I'm just the starting point, not the end solution. They just kind of need to feel confident to inhabit that space. Are you enjoying the lecturing and the teaching? <laughs> yes, I, I love um, talking. I love going to gardening clubs and societies and talking about plants. What I really like about it is that people are very patient and listen to an hour and a half or two hours of me, but then afterwards I get to talk to them and listen to particular plants they love and there's always somebody who has a particular passion for one type of plant and you go away having learned something and I find that fascinating I love it excellent oh question number two and this might be a tricky one is what's the best gardening advice that you've ever received okay actually this is really easy um Bob Brown, who I worked for for a while, he is a nurseryman here with a fantastic collection of plants. His advice was never garden without a pickaxe, um, like a mattock, and he's absolutely right. You try digging out a well-established herbaceous perennial with a hand fork and you're in trouble. We're going to give Bob the credit for that quote, never garden without a pickaxe. 
Absolutely. Fantastic. I can empathize. My soil is clay. What, what they do over here is when they develop houses, they strip off the topsoil and sell it. Yeah, we have that problem as well. And you're left with very difficult, um, undernourished soil, which needs a lot of work to get it healthy again. I've been having some great success with sweet peas. And uh, first season ever growing them, and it was a recommendation from my friend Andy McIndoe, and he just said, grow sweet peas. Fantastic. Yeah. Yes, and he's a very, very inspiring gardener. He's a very good friend of mine, actually. Um, but he always, whenever I see him, I feel like I've learned something. Uh, and always feel it, I kind of feel a little bit cross with myself because he's one of those people that tells you something. You think, oh, I should have known that. So he's brilliant. He really is. Excellent. Question three. Can you recommend one or two of your favorite websites? Maybe you have friends who are garden bloggers or some resource sites that we could uh, share with the listeners. Um, I read, actually, we've been speaking about him. I read Andy McIndoe's blog, which is on my gardening school, a lot because um, it's intelligent writing. So it's aimed at all levels, whether you know very little or you know a lot, and everybody within that spectrum will walk away having got something from it, and I really enjoy that. So he's a brilliant writer. I think that one would be number one. And uh, number two would be Thinking Gardens, which is um, Anne Wareham. She's a British author, and it's just, there's a mixture. Lots of people submit articles, and they can be on design, they can be on planting, they could be on just a particular genus, and I think there's something there for everybody. Often, if it's rainy and miserable and I don't have anything to do, then those would be the two that I would go to to fill half an hour. Fantastic. I'll have those links up on Back to My Garden. Uh, question four. We have people who prefer books. I still love and collect books. Do you have a particular favorite gardening book that you can recommend? Um... Well, I probably have quite a few. Uh, I think if I were just wanting something really nice and inspiring to read that had a few plants that I might want to grow, but also had a really nice story, then it would be We Made a Garden by Marjorie Fish. It's quite an old book, uh, but it's a you know it's a kind of true gardening story, very innocent, very lovely. Uh, that's probably one of my top favorites. Nice. Question number five is a fun one. Gardeners, I find, love to find out something new or something different or try experiments. Okay. Next season, is there something that you've been itching to try as an experiment or is there something that you would encourage the listeners to try next season in their gardens? Um, I'm going to go with something I would get everybody to try and grow uh, because it's my little pet project. And um, this is Lovage a Levisticum officinale. It's an old-fashioned herb. Um, what I love about it is it's got so many good qualities for gardeners. So it's an umbellifery. It reaches about six feet in height. And it has, it's herbaceous, so it dies down. Tough as old boots, as gardeners would say, very hardy. Um, it will easily go down to minus 10, minus 12 here. Uh, so it's pretty robust. The leaves you can use fresh or dried in cookery and soups and stews, casseroles, uh, gravies really benefit from the leaf. It's a bit like celery but only a much nicer flavour. And you can also make a tea from the leaf uh, which is supposed to be like an all-round feel-good elixir. That's quite handy. It's a natural antiseptic so uh, it's got lots of uses there. And the other thing which is nice for gardeners when it's in um, flower, they're quite attractive, but then it produces quite fat, oil-rich seeds. And um, the wild birds really, really love to eat those seeds. So you don't have to put lots of birds out on a bird feeder. So you can just have this plant and you can watch them fly in and do their own thing. So it's got lots of good qualities. Paul, you threw me a curveball. I'm absolutely gobsmacked. I did not expect <laughs> lovage. Well, it's a, it's a good old-time favorite. 
we have a pot from where I'm talking to you right now, not three oh. meters away. I can see it from my window. <laughs> big fan, big fan. Thanks for that. It's uh, that time of year when uh, I help my wife uh, harvest like the cilantro bolts. So we got to pull the pods off and to start drying herbs. And fantastic. So everybody, there you go from one of the top designers in the world. Grow your lovage next season. Paul, our time's been flying by, and uh, I want to I want to encourage all our listeners follow Paul on Twitter at h e r v e y b r o o k e s Harvey Brooks. Check out www.paulharveybrooks.com and uh, share his content and wisdom on social media. The more you share, the more you care. Paul, before I let you go, I want to give you the last word to our listeners today. Do you have maybe some pearls of wisdom or maybe a note of encouragement for a novice gardeners on their gardening adventures? Yes, definitely. I would say um, never read any articles that tell you what's good and what's bad because it's only subjective. And I think lots of people can be put off when they see things and they think, I can't really achieve that or I don't have the money to do that or I don't have the knowledge. Chuck it all out of the window. It's totally irrelevant. All you need to do is think to yourself, I want to make something that's beautiful. Beauty is an individual concept, so that means that it's beautiful to you. So do what you want to do, do what you love, grow the plants that make you happy, and that's enough. It doesn't need to do any more than that. And if you just follow your own heart, then you'll make a garden that you really love. And I think that's the most important thing. Brilliant. I'm sure on behalf of all of the listeners, Paul, we're wishing you a sensational trip to the World Cup in Japan. Thank you. And thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. We've got to have you back. Thank you. It's been fantastic. Hello, garden lover. It's Dave. All of the links, resources, and websites mentioned in this episode will be posted at www.backtomygarden.com front slash 49. If you enjoyed this episode, please come to the website and click share and help us reach brand new gardeners. Have an amazing day. Happy gardening.